so I have four really amazing panelists up here. I'm going to go down to the end. Um, and I'll introduce them one by one and I'll just walk up here. Um, first, we have Steve, Stephen Gorbon. And Stephen Gorbon, you may have heard of him, he's the um, co founder of Honeybee Robotics. He founded it in 1983, and he's currently its chairman. Um, he leads the company's pursuit of new applications in aerospace for advanced robotics and automation techniques. Uh, Mr. Gorbon has been uh, has over 25 years of experience in leading advanced robotics and automation design and uh, development and implementation efforts for NASA, defense, and industry. So come on up, Stephen. Um, next we've got Jeffrey Manberg. Uh, Jeff is the CEO of NanoRax, and he's been at CEO since 2009. He steered the company uh, to become the first to provide research equipment and services to the U.S. National Lab on the International Space Station. Uh, NanoRax has flown over 300 payloads uh, from drug research to CubeSats and is a recognized leader in uh, commercial space services. So come on up, Jeff. Next we have uh, Nick Moisey, and I, I've met this guy several times because he has a really cool uh, laboratory in Brooklyn where they make spacesuits. Um, Nick earned his Master's of Aeronautical Engineering in Moscow in 1986. Since then, he's, his spacesuit glove, uh, space glove designs have been, uh, for Spezza, have been used on uh, Mir, the space station, uh, the Buran, Soyuz, and other spacecraft. He's also collaborated with NASA and European Space Agency on their spacesuit designs. Nick is now the co-founder and chief engineer for Final Frontier Design, which is the Brooklyn-based spacesuit shop I told you about. And um, that was awarded a NASA Space Act agreement in 2014. Uh, his biggest goal is to have his suit designs step on Mars. So come on up, Nick. Uh, we have Matt Borgatti next. He's the lead scientist at Super Releaser. They've got some really cool stuff back there, soft robotics. Um, and Super Releaser is an R&D lab that turns innovations from soft robotics, which is a pretty new field, if you haven't heard of it, into solutions that solve real-world engineering problems. He has a degree in industrial design from the Rhode Island School of Design. He's built animatronic monsters for half a dozen feature films. Matthew has uh, developed prototypes and designs for organizations like Google X Labs, NASA, Souls, Instructables, Makani Power, Adafruit, and Mate. So that's our last panel. Come on up. If you're, uh, if you're watching this, oh, ooh, am I live now? Wait, okay, no. If you're watching this on the internet, uh, make sure that you're using the hashtag New Space City. Uh, that will bundle all of the conversation right up here for us um, and for everyone else to look at. So I've got a few questions for our panelists here. Um, but I want to start off with kind of a perhaps shocking notion to some of us. So New York, we're known for pizza, loud taxis, Broadway, really great but often frustrating subway system. Um, I think the last thing a grizzled New Yorker would associate with New York City is commercial space technology, because we don't have any rocket uh, pads around here, rocket, rocket launch pads. Um, but it has served as a really amazing epicenter for innovation. Uh, just a few things, nuclear energy, um, that started here. Democracy for you know, the United States of America, major battleground for that. Um, the digital revolution, the big computing industry grew up here. So it's, it's got some surprises uh, sitting out there. And so I just want to ask uh, each one of you, you know, what, what are your thoughts on why New York is such a great place for innovation? And perhaps, you know, what are the challenges? Is the rent too damn high? You know, what, sort, what sorts of things do you struggle with here? For me, it's always been uh, the availability of a really good cross-section of engineers and talent. There's, there's uh, a lot of uh, first-generation Americans that are want to work. Necessarily want to leave some of their parents and family that are that emigrated and started out here. We get terrific talent here in New York. Great. So lots of brain power. Uh, what about you? Well, for us at uh, Nanorax, I mean, up to now we've been busy putting payloads on the International Space Station. But we recently launched a public benefits corporation called Dream Up, which is focused on the education. 
and uh, media and branding. So we're beginning to tap the New York expertise in software, e-commerce platforms. Uh, and so for us, I think the chapter's now opening on the talent of New York playing a role in the new chapter of space exploration. Nick, did you have anything to add to that? So we probably work together as much as on new next generation features and uh, especially the growth, like, like uh, the most complicated part of the future. And uh, <clears throat> New York is a nice place for us to hire any professional in any field, computer engineer. Uh, <clears throat> New York has a lot of freelancers and uh, in many fields. So it's a, New York is a melting pot of professional fields that really helps you advance your, your design yeah, yeah. and your mission. Just to sort of take you know, launch off from what you said, um, I take advantage of the fact that we have a lot of people here who have to ship things, whose job requires them to build and ship, so whether it's engineers or people who are working in prototyping shops. Uh, New York has a wide cross section of, say, ID students who are graduating from Pratt that are eager to work on weird new projects, to people who have a, like their day job is actually shipping costumes that have to survive the next year um, being abused every day. So that I've been able to take advantage of that pool of talent that's here. I mean, you have to you exchange that for high rent and manufacturing costs a little bit more here. But on the other side, the cross-section of people is incredible. Great. And so you got into the challenges a little bit there. Um, but let's, let's talk about this in, in practical terms here. So you've got this hub of innovation, brain power, you know, the, the shipping center. Um, you have some really creative types living here to work with. What do you do with all that? What are, what are I guess, some of the most exciting, what's the most exciting one or two things all of you are working on right now? And I'll start with Steve, and then we'll just work our way down. Sure. Well, um, I'm very fortunate. I mean, I, I, as a little boy, I was one of those kids that were brought into the lunchroom to watch. I didn't see the Mercury launches, but I watched the Gemini launches with my class. I was hooked. And in fact, my company was started for not a single business reason, except for that I wanted to be in the space business. And uh, fortunately, we've been able to get into the space business. And um, so many exciting things have happened. I, I guess I'd have to say what comes to mind is uh, I'm a member of the, the Mars Exploration Rover and the Curiosity. Uh, science team. Uh, our company has prov uh, provided um, a number of devices, uh, not only on the Spirit Opportunity and Curiosity rover, but also the Phoenix Lander. Uh, we're working on some equipment for the Mars 2020 rover. And um, I, with too many th projects to choose from, I'd have to say that we're hopefully going to be involved in the, um, uh, the OneWeb um, uh, constellation of spacecraft that's going to be uh, launched. This is 700 spacecraft, folks. And uh, it looks like we're going to be involved, and I, I hope so anyway. I think this is, is tremendously exciting. It's going to bring broadband internet to literally hundreds of millions of people who do not have access at this moment. So, uh, you know, this is a huge commercial project in our, in our house. Usually we work for NASA and the Air Force and some others, but this is a commercial venture that really has got me excited. And uh, when does that kick off? Uh, actually, they're talking about having initiating service by 2019. Um, what about you? I, I guess for us, the most exciting project now is uh, we're getting approval from NASA to build their own doorway on the space station. Uh, they call it an airlock, we call it the commercial doorway to outer space. And we're self-funding this, and this is going to allow us to control uh, all sorts of commercial products that want to leave the space station, come back into the space station. And what makes it so exciting for us is, at some point, uh, it should be up in two and a half years, and then at some point in the future, we can remove that and make it part of our own space station. So we're really beginning now our own space station, but you know we don't have a lot of deep pockets, so we're doing it step by step starting with the doorway and then later we become part of our own platform. The other interesting product, a little more down to earth, is you may have heard we aged Art Bag uh, Scotch whiskey on the space station. And uh, we aged it for uh, two years in little uh, oak casts. And, the, and we wanted to see if in microgravity, Scotch would age differently. And son of a gun, it did. 
And uh, the uh, Ardbeg had uh, chief scientists. Yes, they have a chief scientist. And uh, they sent it out for all these tests. And the interesting thing was that in microgravity, the scotch, uh, the, it's not scotch, but it was the, um, uh, whatever they call it, the, um, um, I forget, the spirit, before the pre-spirits, um, that liquid aged as if it had been in the oak cask for five years. So it actually aged faster. And so you never know what is the killer app in a new frontier. And of course, NASA wants it to be cancer, and we all want it to be enlightenment or something. If we can do better scotch on the space station, that's a killer app, and that will open the door for a lot of exploration. So that's probably the, one of the more exciting projects we're working and, on. And you brought some of that with you today, right? <laughs> because we need to try it. No. Uh, no. Nick, what about you? What, what is the most exciting thing you're working on at Final Frontier Design? We uh, excited, uh, Final Frontier Design, excited work together with NASA on next generation species, especially for commercial field files. Um, next uh, generation should be has less cost, more robust than current NASA species. Uh, especially the most uh, uh, exciting project for us is uh, mechanical counter pressure cloud, the next generation principle. So we received uh, last year a contract from NASA, one year with deliverable in August, <coughs> uh, a new principle, uh, more complicated glove than existing, but more flexible. And uh, new glove has a few times more parts than current NASA glove. And uh, we uh, Really excited to work on that. Yeah. So, so the, the future of space clubs, that's the next project. It sounds very exciting. And what about you, Matt? Yeah. Well, I, I can speak to that a little bit because uh, we're actually working together on the project. Um, I'm providing soft robotic elements to do uh, pressure control across this. And so, um, what's exciting for me is that this field that I'm interested in soft robotics, this concept that soft matter can be engineered in such a way that you get predictable motion out of it, whether it's cloth or rubber. Um, human beings, for all of our history, have made things using hard matter mechanisms, using, you know, metal. And a majority of the mechanisms that have ever solved a problem are soft. Nature has solved incredible problems in kinematics with soft stuff. So being able to engineer that soft stuff for, say, applying pressure evenly across the human body, whether it's you know, you're trying to do thromboprophylaxis um, or making sure that people don't get blood clots in their legs or, you know, countering G, uh, G pressure from somebody who's, you know, piloting a jet fighter, being able to specifically apply pressure and motion across the body. So that's one of the exciting things about working with Final Frontier on this mechanical counter pressure glove. It's an interesting application for a new field of engineering. What I'm excited about in my own company is I figured out ways to mass produce soft robots. So there are sort of two flavors of this. One is exoskeletons for the human body for doing motion like you have a soft exoskeleton that weighs a couple of pounds, you have cerebral palsy, you want to grip you know, crutches to get out of the wheelchair, we can provide that pressure evenly like across the body. And the second one being an unlimited number of mechanisms in a really simple process. So we figured out ways, like the water pads that I have out on the demo, is you in one process can have a ton of mechanisms into the same cheap little unit. They're not, say, you know, all stepper motors, but inside of the soft robotics genre, you get incredible complexity for a really cheap price. Got it. So you're basically figuring out a way to debulkify spacesuits yes. uh, in some way. Yes. And you're also figuring out wild applications for soft robotics that you haven't even imagined yet. Yeah, taking that, digging in, finding where other people outside of NASA want it. Got it. Um, so that actually brings about my next point. We've got. You know, this, this, this idea of disruption and, and bringing something new to the table. We've got a lot of traditional, big, um, storied companies out there in space, like Lock, the Lockheed Martins and Boeings and Northrop Grumman's of the world. Um, this month, really, this past, this, the first three months of this year, we've seen some really incredible stuff. Uh, we've seen <coughs> SpaceX launch a payload in orbit and land a booster on a ship at sea, which um, could radically reduce the cost of space flight, access to space. Um, that remains to be seen. 
but it's a very exciting thing. We've also got Blue Origin doing similar things with suborbital rockets. We've got all of this, uh, all of this new activity. Um, and then we have some more extreme things, like in this building right over here, uh, One World Trade Center, um, earlier this month, Star uh, Breakthrough Starshot was announced, and that's where we're going to be launching nanocraft on laser beams to Alpha Centauri. So um, it's a pretty exciting time, and I just wanted to prey upon that for a moment. Um, what do you think? What do you think are the most underappreciated opportunities here with this surge of, of new activity in spaceflight? Um, and specifically, is there anything here in New York that you're capitalizing on or, or thinking about going out there? And we'll start with Steve and work our way down. Uh, well, if you mean by underappreciated, you mean um, opportunities that are sort of part of this wave of activity that we're seeing that's a lot of it led by Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and even Robert Bigelow who's launched an inflatable structure into space. Is that what you mean? Yes. Well, I, I, I mean, I think um, this, is a, this is largely a wave that's uh, commercially oriented and I think it's very exciting because we really didn't have that 20 years ago uh, when I was still working in the space business. It was literally all NASA and Air Force driven. Um, so I would, I would go back to, uh, I think, the, the cost and the, it's the interest in not only nano spacecraft, but CubeSats, smaller spacecraft that can hitch rides. There's lots of room on um, in fairings where larger uh, satellites are being lofted into space. There's relatively cheap, cheap access. We're also able to uh, build, I would not call them uh, micro mechanisms, but miniature mechanisms now small gyroscopes uh, and so on. This, this is the bailiwick of a company like mine. And uh, so, like I said about the one web system, which is gonna literally revolve, it would involve 700 in space. There, you'd have to have hundreds more uh, in, in a, on your shelf ready to start replacing the ones that are you know, fall, falling out of service. Uh, so I would call that, um, a huge opportunity. It, it's, I can't emphasize enough for a company like ours, it's a tremendously new and big opportunity. So that, that cost and the, the amount of space you're having in these, these commercial spacecraft is really opening up some doors. Well, who's ever heard of a, of a 700 um, spacecraft uh, commercial enterprise? It's, it's unprecedented. The, the GPS system, the old Motorola um, Iridium system, they were a, a, a less than a tenth of the size of what we're talking about. I mean, for us, uh, the most exciting thing is when we started Nanorack six years ago, nobody had ever paid for services on the International Space Station. We didn't know if anyone would have pay for a service. You were just saying about CubeSats, we've deployed over 96, I think it is, CubeSats from the space station. We help launch Planet Labs, Spira, and other companies. Uh, we have high schools that are flying. Uh, Blue Origin has chosen uh, Nanorax to do their business development. Uh, what's most exciting about the time now is that you have private capital at risk. And you can't understand how that fundamentally changes everything. At Nanorax, 8% of my revenue is from, that, is from NASA. You can do the math. 92% is not from NASA. Well, that changes everything. NASA is not designing my hardware. Okay, uh, I'm allowed to work on a commercial basis. What is so exciting about this time is that we're taking the imagination, the creativity of the private sector, which you all take for granted, that you have an idea and you go ahead and do it. You can find venture capital, you can put money together. That's now possible in space. And when you look at Made in Space, when you look at my company, we're self-funded. When you look at, you know, Bezos is a different level. When you look at Bigelow, when you look at this generation, what you're seeing is that we're not being held back by the government there. And like Steve was just saying, the government before was the entire market. And now the government is not the entire market. And so the most fundamental change, which is just amazing, is that the government is now a customer and it's not the market. Yes. And that is what is so exciting for us who've been in it for a while. And we see the difference, and we know that we need your creativity to come in, and the government's not holding you back. 
Nick, what do you, what is the most underappreciated opportunity in your eyes? With, we started work as a uh, company on spacefield design and development for commercial space flight. But NASA is our prime contractor. No funding from NASA than total from other commercial space. Commercial space is rising and a uh, lot of speculation about that. But, uh, in the future, we hope to get more contracts from commercial. Uh, right now, NASA really supports us. So, so as that, that industry gears up even more, you're going to see some more opportunities, it sounds like. Yeah. I'm, I'm seriously excited about citizen science. I, I found there's this giant wave of the Pacific Maker community. It's a, you know, it gets used a lot of makers. But it's actually the opportunity to have science happening in further and further fields where you say you take NASA's space development, there are only so many majors you can have to work in those labs. But you look at advanced uh, or development projects like NARPA, DARPA's Robotics Fast Track, trying to get small projects done with interesting people, interesting ideas. I have these opportunities to work with people with weird backgrounds to solve problems in ways they haven't considered before with small amounts of money doing things that have potentially never been done where like I can rapidly prototype and also rapidly validate where I can you know create my own testing equipment to test a device that I and another engineer working a thousand miles away got a tiny bit of money to work on together we test it we iterate it real quick we turn it in and we can do that for such a tiny amount of money that it's worth it to say the government to create a little program to take that risk and other businesses seem to be catching on creating sort of external startups that play around in weird spaces and that's that's been really exciting because it hasn't been happening up until now so all that all that communication internet infrastructure rapid prototyping devices like 3d printing yeah it's, it's lowering the risk but financially for yeah funding yeah, I can say get precision parts water cut from a file I make in Adobe Illustrator and have them sent to me in a day when previously I would have had to own the machine. Fantastic. Um, so I'm just going to take a big step back here. Um, everyone look around the room because I think many of us are going to be alive when we see the first uh, footsteps on Mars. Um, so th that's pretty fantastic. We have NASA working on SLS and Orion, sort of internally. We've got SpaceX working on um, Falcon Heavy and Red Dragon and other systems to get us there. We've got Russia and China interested in the game of getting to Mars. Um, and there's also talk of China getting to moon in the next 10 years or so, uh, establishing a moon base. So there's some really fantastical things going on right now. Um, and I've kind of asked this question before, but taken from this bigger step, you know, looking 10, 20, 50 years in the future, um, where do you see yourselves and your companies fitting into all of this, uh, into missions to Mars, into moon bases, into you know things like Starshot that are sort of bigger and bolder um, than anything we've ever tried before? How do you? Um, what's sort of the grand vision? I guess is my question, Steve. Well, I'm not sure about the grand vision, but I can say that uh, uh, it's very likely the Orion spacecraft will form the, the backbone of the first uh, manned mission to Mars. And my company is uh, supplying, the, supplying the emergency hatch for that spacecraft. And that's, uh, you know, the, the, assuming the Orion uh, and the SLS lives in the Senate, um, this is a, it's like a shuttle program. This is a 40-year program. So I've got 40 years of emergency hatches that I'm going to be involved with. And it's really actually, you know, for a company like ours, it's a big deal. And um, so we were literally, and I hope to have maybe some more involvement in the SLS and Orion, but this emergency hatch is for now. And then, of course, uh, uh, Honeybee Robotics, my company, has a, a, a long in, uh, uh, storied uh, track record with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory who will clearly uh, be, right now, I mean, all the Mars missions that we have going, to me, it's reconnaissance for manned missions. And we're seeing that we have, where, where you know, the Russians have placed a 
uh, a neutron detector to see if there's water on Mars. I mean, they're, they're, they're smart. I mean, they're looking for where the water is and um, in anticipation of sending people to Mars. And of course, water turns into fuel and so on. Um, so I anticipate, uh, I mean, I, I, we've moved an office to with less than a mile within of the gates of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where I think we have over 30 people, I have a colleague in the audience, um, working uh, at our, the Honeybee Robotics Pasadena facility. We're going to be servicing JPL for the rest, for, for the rest of our lives. And since their involvement in the, the Mars program, I expect to be involved in um, not only the reconnaissance uh, missions to come, but the, manned, the eventual manned mission, which hopefully will not be beyond 2030. Uh, and just a procedural note, uh, Jeff, you have to leave. I think, I, think, uh, I think we're doing fine. Yeah, so if he gets up and leaves, it's okay. not because he doesn't like us, okay. because he has to be somewhere. Yeah. So just a procedural Oh, we're doing fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, what, what is like okay. the, the big, the grand vision for, for the interaction? Yeah, we, we like to say that we're not in the hardware business. And I just told you a moment ago we're doing this doorway on the space station, but we're having someone else build it, and we're doing it for customers. So we're really in the customer business. So uh, Blue Origin was starting to use their platform, their suborbital, and soon they'll be orbital. And so for me, I don't. I, I want as many platforms in all sorts of places throughout the solar system. And my job and our business is to get customers whether they're research scientists, whether they're artists. And so as you talk about art, and you talk about going to the moon, for us as we look out, we want to have as much of the society involved in using the space frontier, either to use the environment of space, to better understand the Earth and solve the problems here on Earth. So we're pretty unique in that we don't say, hey, we want to go to Mars. But if someone's going to Mars, Damn it, we want to be there and we want to help the customers who will be there. If they're going to the, we work with the Chinese now, we work with the Russians, we work with the Europeans, we work with the Americans. Uh, and so what we're trying to build up is to make as many people as possible begin to utilize space. We lower our prices. Uh, you can do a 30 day project with us on the space station, a small mixed do, starting at $15,000. And we have schools doing that. Okay, and we have bake sales, parents doing bake sales, to, so their kids have projects on the International Space Station. No one would ever have thought that. And so, for me, the vision is to go onwards, to have someone else go onwards to Mars, and we'll be there making sure that the future parents are doing bake sales so their kids have some project on the surface of Mars. So, so you're going to be the uh, solar system's customer service department. Yes, that's what we, that's <laughs> what, I mean, we told everybody we were doing it on the space station, and then Blue Origin came along and said, we want you to do it on Blue, and so we'll announce another platform soon, and so yes, we want to be on all the platforms, using the platform for customers. Okay. Okay, uh, is the um, mandatory for any human space mission. Uh, space is the phase of space mission. Okay. If you are going to any destination, moon, Mars, or sticker, even you have to have space <laughs> And uh, if you are looking for a uh, new EVA Institute uh, of the NASA, it is more heavy than previous generation. You couldn't walk on Mars on 300 pounds space. So, we are looking for next generation issue, much lighter, but more robust, more comfortable, but more flexible for any human space. So the, cool. the fashion designer of the solar system, <laughs> yeah. the grand vision for uh, uh, Final Frontier. Yeah. What about you, Matt? Um, well, to me, there's a, there's a reason why you want people in space. Like, you can take executive action as a person. You can improvise. You, we can use our senses to detect fine things that it's, it's difficult to do remotely, say at a 14-minute you know, delay trying to talk to Mars. But having a person there, I mean, of course, the disadvantage is people can't survive on Mars without something. 
<laughs> it happens to be a, a flexible spacecraft that we wear. Um, I'm really excited for the opportunities to deal with the individual problems that come from the different environments that we're going to have to put people in. We're probably going to send people to um, uh, subplanetary bodies. We're probably going to send people to you know, asteroids that might have platinum on them, that have you know, rare, rare elements that we can't find on Earth, or to find out more about the history of our, our solar system or of the universe. Um, each of those are going to come with their own problems, and we're going to want a toolkit for each of those that fits to the body. And that's something that I'm excited about, is that we're going to start kitting out the human body to be capable of doing extensive missions on environments that we so far know even less about than Mars. And that hurdle and that challenge is exciting because we have this, this opportunity to create something that gets people at their best and can blend what's good about robotics, you know, robustness and strength, with what's good about people, executive decision and sensation. And see, you got a comment? Yeah, I was just gonna say that um, you know, people ask, why are we going to send people to Mars? And they're going to ask it in an ever-increasing rate. Uh, I had a little anecdote uh, that I, I would say, that is when we landed um, uh, Spirit on Mars at the Gusev Crater, um, there was a, a, a Steve Squires, our, our principal investigator, noticed something. And what it was is that if, if we took a, 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 a geologist and landed him on a helicopter out in the Mojave Desert, and he got out, typically he would, he would survey his horizon, he would see an interesting rock at about 30 meters distance, which was the most interesting rock he'd see, and he'd walk over to it, and he'd pick it up, and he'd hit it with a rock hammer to reveal a fresh surface, and he'd look at it with his loop. That's about less than a minute. Now, the Spirit rover could do pretty much that same activity, walking over, with its with this mass and spectrometer, analyze an interesting rock in the distance, we'd make a decision, we'd go over, uh, we'd use the rock abrasion tool, which we built, uh, to open up a clean surface on the rock and put an instrument head on those rocks to get a preliminary analysis of what's inside the rock. But that took four and a half days. So sending people to Mars, we have, we've, we've moved, we've, operations have increased in terms of efficiency on the Curiosity rover, but not by a hell of a lot. So sending people to Mars uh, to do science, uh, to do, to do um, the necessary work to establish a, a, you know, an eventual colonization of Mars, you, there's, no, there's no substitute for sending people to do a lot of efficient work. Um, so we're going to move to a Q&A section now. Um, I had to kill one of my questions, but I'm going to revive it because I'm going to pass it on this piece of paper. Um, and that is, how do people get involved? How can makerspaces um, make an impact in NASA's world, get connected to help the space movement? Um, and furthermore, there are other, there are lots of young people watching this, uh, perhaps, I hope so, lots of young people watching this webcast. Um, what advice would you give them other yeah. than, you know, be an engineer or go, <laughs> go get to coding, like learn how to code things? Yeah. What would you tell them? Um, to help with this movement. And it is, in my eyes, more of a movement than it is a business, and I, I seem to hear that from you. How, yeah. yeah. How do people get involved? I, I mean, I, I'd start with SBIRs, um, at least yeah. getting familiar with it, like grants.gov. Um, that is a lot of labor, um, but there are smaller things, contests. NASA has a bunch of contests, space apps right here. Um, there are lots of small ways to poke at NASA because as much as you're trying to get in touch with them, they're trying to get in touch with you. They want new energy and new blood in the administration. Because as you've seen, like NASA, like go up and down in the public consciousness and up and down in budget. They know that they, to survive and do long-term goals, they need long-term interest. And so finding people who are super excited, finding people who are gonna make an amazing school project that's going to go up on the space station keeps them alive. Um, we have time for one last question, um, and that is, and, and I, I like this question a lot because we've been talking about China, uh, Russia, U.S. sort of independently, but the question is how much international collaboration do you foresee in the future? Um, perhaps on a Mars mission, a moon mission, do you think space will help sort of dissolve those boundaries um, to tech technological innovations? 
Um, I was one of the folks in the 90s that pushed for the political participation of uh, Russia uh, in the International Space Station. And it was a great idea in the 90s. And uh, now a lot of my time is spent on dealing with political issues with Russia, with Japan. Um, political is good on, in, in, in the arena of politics. It can really screw things up in operations. And so uh, I'm coming to a different view. I mean, it's really wonderful. We have to involve as many countries as possible. But how you keep the politics out of it, I just don't know. We were talking this morning, coming down here, how New Amsterdam was founded by a company, you know, it was a company. Hmm. And as a company, I mean, Manhattan was founded by a company. And as a company, they stayed out of the wars in Europe. And so that's one of the reasons the harbor prospered here, because it was run commercially. So we have to have, and it was international, it was an international company. We have to have as many nations involved as possible, but boy, it's difficult. I'd say that because of the history, we'll, we'll always do cooperative efforts with the Russians, especially in manned space, and that's good, yeah. because we need common ground with the Russians. But, and the Europeans, we, it will be essential to going uh, to Mars, I believe. But I doubt we're going to do it with the Chinese. Nick, do you have any, uh, as, a, as a person of Russia, do you have anything to add to this? Oh, <clears throat> uh, when we started this business, uh, uh, we found that uh, future restriction for the space technology, ITAR, mm -hmm. import regulation rules. So, <clears throat> and uh, my partner, Ted Southern, uh, paid uh, 10 thousand dollars for license for me that share with me pieces technology secret but that I bring secret to the United States. Yeah so spacesuits are weapons yeah. I don't know a couple, yeah. Yeah, couple <laughs> years ago I wrote for the softener and uh, right now we, we can sew pieces uh, for the foreigner with much simplified for people. Um, and did you want to close us out here, Matt? <laughs> On collaboration with other yes. countries? Well, it, I mean, it just sort of, pat, maybe it's my age, but it passively comes naturally to me to reach out to like the internet to collaborate on the problems that I'm working on. Like I attend a conference in Hamburg, CCC every year, and I have been talking about soft robotics there. And like that got me in touch with engineers at Festo and like there's, to me, I don't see the boundaries as much because I'm not dealing as much with government agencies. And it comes as a surprise to me when there are restrictions on working with other, other companies because I'm working internationally as, uh, as much as I'm working domestically. All right, uh, everyone, let's thank the panelists for the time. <laughs>